Thanks, Kate. Uh, so I am going to finish up by talking about a chapter that we actually uh, pre-released last week that you may have seen uh, some coverage of, uh, looking at universal credit, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, is an extremely radical uh, attempt to overhaul the working age uh, benefit system to integrate uh, most of the separate benefits and tax credits that we currently have for those of working age into one uh, payment. Uh, this is perhaps the most radical structural overhaul for uh, many decades, um, but it also affects a huge number of people. And um, to give you some sense, about 7 million households currently claim or are currently entitled to at least one of the so called legacy benefits, the benefits that will be replaced uh, by universal credit. So it's a very, very important reform. Uh, you'll almost certainly know about the well-documented uh, delays in the planned rollout of universal credit, and of course there, there is still a lot of uncertainty about the timing and smoothness of, uh, of that rollout. Uh, but actually, in, in a long-run sense, even more importantly, um, the changes are the changes to what universal credit will look like once it is rolled out. Um, that, has, uh, that has changed a lot because of a number of uh, announcements at successive fiscal events, including back at the July budget uh, to cut universal credit relative to the previous plan. Now, those were cuts that were announced alongside similar cuts to tax credits. Uh, those tax credit cuts were U-turned on, uh, as you know, in the November uh, autumn statement, but that didn't apply to universal credit. Those cuts remain in the pipeline. As a result of that and other cuts that have been made, universal credit is now, contrary to the original intention, another net benefit cut. It will actually, introducing universal credit will in the long run reduce entitlements by, we think, about £3 billion per year relative to just keeping the, the legacy system in place. Um, but this is, a, this is an area where just looking at averages isn't particularly helpful because this is a huge structural change. There are many complexities under the bonnet. Different groups are affected differently. Um, so the aim of this chapter is really to understand where we are now with the universal credit, given how much that has changed, not least because uh, on past form, if the Chancellor did at this budget or at future fiscal events look to dip further into the welfare budget for whatever reason, then it looks likely universal credit would be, uh, would likely to uh, be, be in, the, in the firing line. So at the very least, we want to understand where we are now in terms of the effects of the current plan. Uh, a couple of things to say on the scope of the analysis before I present it to you. Um, one is that there are, of course, a number of other cuts to the legacy benefit system that are coming in here. So things like, uh, as Gemma mentioned earlier, the four-year freeze to most working age benefit rates. Um, those are other cuts. Those are important too, but we're not looking at them here. Uh, those are things that are happening under the legacy system. They will also largely carry through into UC. So, for example, freezing the child element of child tax credit also means freezing the child element of universal credit. But that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the additional effect of replacing the reformed legacy system with universal credit. Now, both of those sets of reforms affect very broadly similar groups of people. We're talking about low-income, working-age people. Um, but in aggregate, the, cuts, the other cuts to the legacy system, which largely carry through into UC, are a lot larger than the, the net cut from introducing UC. So it's worth just having that sense of perspective. The focus here is just on the impact of introducing UC. Uh, now, the other thing to say is that there are transitional arrangements in place, which are very, in terms of understanding the shorter run effects of universal credit, are very important. Uh, they mean that uh, claimants, existing claimants of legacy benefits can't actually lose out at the point when they are migrated onto universal credit. So in the short run, that's clearly very important. Um, in the long run, the, the transitional arrangements are, are, are irrelevant, and, and we are interested here in the long run. So we're entirely ignoring the transitional protection, which is what, uh, important to bear in mind in how you interpret what I'm going to be saying. So to get a handle on what's going on here, uh, I will use an example, um, an example of a lone parent with two children, and looking at how their entitlements to means-tested benefits and tax credits um, are structured currently under the current system and then showing how that changes uh, when universal credit comes in. So plotting along the uh, horizontal axis the number of hours that this person might choose to work, assuming they earn the national living wage per hour, and along the vertical axis uh, their benefit entitlements. And first of all, focusing on the current system of benefits and tax credits, means-tested ones. Um, so here they are, and there's a few things to notice about this. Uh, one is there are lots of different colours, so the, the, the system is relatively complicated in that um, this lone parent is very likely to have to claim more than one benefit at the same time. Um, and indeed, if they change the number of hours they're working, they're likely to have to stop claiming certain benefits and start claiming other ones. 
Uh, for example, if they move into work, they'll have to stop claiming job seekers allowance and, and uh, very likely start claiming uh, working tax credit. Um, so that's in terms of the, uh, the sort of claimant experience, if, if you like, how simple the system is to navigate, that's one thing to note. In terms of the financial incentives that it creates, uh, probably two things uh, worth noting. One is the, this conspicuous jump up in entitlement under the current system when this lone parent works 16 hours a week. That's because of the way that the working tax credit system uh, works. Um, another thing to note is that there are, uh, it, it's possible for them to lose entitlement quite rapidly um, as they increase their earnings. And one of the key reasons for that, certainly if you focus on the region above 16 hours a week, is that if you increase hours beyond that point, you can lose more than one benefit at the same time because we have these multiple strands of support layered on top of each other. So if you increase hours beyond 16, the blue bit gets smaller, you lose some tax credits, but so does the yellow bit. You also lose some housing benefit. So the combined effect of that on the incentive to earn more can be quite, uh, quite large. This is what universal credit will do to the system. Um, so first of all, obviously, there's only one benefit here replacing the other uh, four in this example. Um, so it's, it's, it's simpler in that obvious sense. Um, the rate at which benefits are withdrawn once they start getting withdrawn um, is uh, somewhat slower for this example. And again, one of the key reasons for that is you don't lose multiple benefits at the same time because there is only one, uh, one single means test uh, operating. On the other hand, there's no jump up in entitlement at 16 hours a week as there is under the current system. So in this particular example, the net effect of that is that this lone parent would actually get less benefits under the universal credit system if they work anything between 16 and 40 hours per week. But you can see that that kind of conclusion is very sensitive to particular choices that have been made, uh, notably the level of uh, this parameter here. This corresponds to the amount of earnings that, you're, that you can get under universal credit before you start losing your entitlement. This is known as the work allowance. This is the thing that has been repeatedly trimmed back at many fiscal events, uh, including at the July budget. Um, you can see that if, if this were higher, the whole white line to the right of that would also be higher, and the, and the losses for working loan parents in this, in, in, of this type would be smaller or, or would not exist. Um, so that's, uh, that's the main way in which this, the, the planned system has changed, not just for loan parents, but for other family types as well. So moving away from an example and thinking about uh, what, this, what all this means uh, for a representative uh, sample of the whole uh, working age population, we're actually just focusing on those who are on legacy benefits, so people on means-tested benefits now. Um, what does this mean uh, on average in terms of the direct effects on their incomes? And there are a number of ways that you can summarize this. This is a relatively simple one, just splitting people into four groups, uh, depending on whether there's someone in the household in work or not and depending on whether the uh, household rents or owns their home. Uh, so to start off with the out-of-work groups, uh, you see that on average there are quite significant losses for out-of-work groups. Now that reflects that within these groups you've got a lot of people, like the example I just showed you, who actually would be unaffected. If you're out of work, the entitlements, you, because the basic elements of universal credit are tagged to the current system, uh, in many cases they will be unaffected. But you've also got uh, people who lose out quite significantly within these groups. For example, if you have uh, a lot of savings, uh, unearned income and assets are treated more harshly um, under universal credit than under tax credit. So you've got some significant losers within those groups. Now, the in-work groups, this helps to bring out one of the main, one of the key features of universal credit. So the, the one group who gain on this chart, on average, again, only on average, are uh, working renters. Um, whereas working owner-occupiers also lose quite significantly, as do non-working owner-occupiers. Um, now, one of the main reasons for this is because of the way that universal credit uh, integrates multiple benefits into one. So if you take a, a typical in-work renter on means-tested benefits, they are likely to be both on housing benefit and on tax credits. And those, can, those entitlement to both of those things can go down as a lone parent moves into work or, or increases their earnings. So the combined rate at which they lose benefits in work can be quite high. Whereas under universal credit, there's only one means test, so the combined rate at which they lose benefits tends to be lower. So that's uh, one of the key things driving those gains. For owner-occupiers, that's not the case. They don't get housing benefit, because that's only for renters. Um, and actually, if you're just on tax credits, uh, universal credit will actually be withdrawn more quickly than tax credits alone under the current system. So uh, that's one of the key reasons why owner-occupiers uh, tend to do much less well. Now, you can do all kinds of splits, and we do a whole load in the chapter. Um, 
I'm just going to show you one other one, really just to, to show you how much variation there is in the effects. I'm not going to go through explaining these patterns in any particular detail. Um, we do uh, go through some of these cases in the chapter. Uh, but you can see that the, the effects, even defining families quite broadly still, based on family type and, and work status, they do vary quite a lot. Um, from working loan parents, uh, who on average lose about £1,000 a year, uh, non-working couples uh, without children lose on average about £2,000 a year, and actually got one family type who gain, uh, a one earner couple with children. So say, there, are there are reasons for all of these things, I'm not going to go into them because uh, we don't have time, but you can see there is a lot of variation uh, in the effect, and so again, really dealing with averages doesn't get you all that far in understanding what's going on. Now that is just thinking about the direct impacts of this change on people's incomes in the long run. Uh, what about making work pay, though? This is probably, it's fair to say, the central uh, tenet of the reform, in, in, certainly in the way that the government talks about it. Um, so we're going to look at this as well. And specifically, we're going to measure uh, how uh, this change affects financial measures of incentives to work in two ways. Uh, we're going to be interested, first of all, in the incentive to be in paid work at all, relative to not being in work. Uh, we're going to measure that called some, uh, using something called the participation tax rate, that is a measure of the proportion of your earnings that you lose, either because you pay tax on them, or because by having those earnings, your benefit entitlements go down. Okay, but we're also interested in the incentive to progress when in work, to earn a little bit more for those who are already in work, whether it's through increasing hours of work or promotion, just moving to a better pay job, whatever it is. Um, so we're going to measure that as well, uh, and that's going to be measured using something called the effective marginal tax rate, um, which is basically the same concept, but applied just to the next pound of income you might earn. So of that next pound, how much of that would you pay tax on or lose because you find your benefit entitlement goes down? Uh, really, all you need to remember is just that higher numbers mean weaker financial work incentives here. These are, these are effective tax rates. Uh, in fact, you, don't, you barely even need to know that um, because the, um, the colors on this beautiful chart will do most of the work for you. So... Uh, this is going, if you focus first of all on the, on the top bar that I brought up first, um, this shows you uh, for the whole uh, working age population um, the effect of introducing universal credit on the incentive to be in work rather than not be in work. And blue colours mean the incentive gets stronger and orange colours uh, mean that the incentive gets weaker, so sort of danger of weak work incentives. Uh, and the, uh, the middle uh, white uh, Category is just no change, okay? And darker colors mean larger changes. Um, and actually, you can see here that overall, uh, the effects are pretty mixed. You've got roughly equal numbers of people seeing a strengthening of the incentive to be in work uh, as seeing a weakening. Uh, but what this uh, masks is that universal credit does a lot of good work where we might care about it most in the sense of, if you look at the people who currently face the most severe disincentives to uh, work, it tends to uh, strengthen those incentives quite significantly. So the next bars order people according to how high their participation tax rate is now, i.e. how weak their incentive financially is to work now. So if you look at the bottom two categories, we're looking at people who keep no more than 10 pence, that's uh, 10% rather, uh, of, uh, of what they earn because of the benefits they, they, they lose and the taxes they pay. And you can see the large swathes of dark blue down there. So large majorities of those people find that their incentive to be in work is strengthened. And that's largely because you get rid of these situations where people are losing more than one benefit at the same time uh, when they move into work. Um, just to also point out, again, uh, as, as with direct effects on incomes, there's a lot of variation depending on who you look at, um, in part, for example, because the levels of the work allowances for different groups are different. Um, just to pick out two examples, lone parents actually find in, in three quarters of cases uh, that the incentive to be in work will be weaker as a result of universal credit. Um, and that's, that's a number that's got a lot bigger as a result of the cuts to the work allowances that have been preemptively made. Um, whereas you take people uh, with children in couples uh, whose partner doesn't work, about two thirds of them find that their incentive to be in work is stronger as a result of universal credit. So again, a lot of variation uh, under the bonnet. And finally, the, the second type of work incentive I, measure, uh, I mentioned, uh, the incentive if you're already in work to earn a little bit more. Um, so showing the same beautiful uh, chart, but here focusing on people who are in work on legacy benefits, deciding whether to work a little bit more. 
So again, overall, the effects are quite mixed. About half of people see a slightly stronger incentive to earn more as a result of universal credit, but not much less than that see a weakening, uh, actually. But again, if you look at the, uh, where the disincentives are most severe right now, universal credit pretty much eliminates the weakest work incentives caused by the current system. And again, it's for the same reason. Uh, it's because it eliminates situations where people earn a bit more and they lose multiple benefits at the same time. So in conclusion, uh, after that slightly whistle-stop tour of the, the current shape of universal credit, um, so under the current plans, it will be now substantially less generous on average uh, than the current system and than the original plan. Indeed, that's why it's less generous than the current system, because of the cuts that have been made since it was first laid out. But within that are a very large number of winners as well as, uh, as, well as losers. The effects really are complicated, unsurprisingly, given this is such a, a radical structural change. And similarly, the impacts on, on financial work incentives and making work pay, as the government uh, would say, uh, they're also complex, and they've also changed a lot due to the revised plans. But I think it is worth, to be fair, it is worth stressing that the, the most welcome effect here of universal credit is the one that's kind of inherent to the kind of reform that it is. Because it integrates benefits, it gets rid of the most severe disincentives caused when people lose multiple ones at the same time. And that advantage does still remain. Um, having said all that, it's probably worth really just a, a caveat, and this is that there are lots of non-financial changes associated with universal credit too. Now, we much harder to number crunch, the effects are very uncertain, in part because in many cases these things haven't been tried before. So, for example, extending job search conditions to a lot of working claimants. But these could turn out to be extremely important too, and to also affect things like how much people choose to work. Um, and, of course, the administrative challenge of actually implementing the thing um, may well be the thing that carries the greatest risk to the actual success and smooth operation of the programme. And uh, that concludes. I'll hand you back to Paul.